Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Don Wood, thank you for your willingness to contribute to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Each of these interviews have begun by giving uh, listeners or viewers a chance to learn something about the interviewee. So tell us about Don Wood, who you are, and, and what you've done for decades in this community. Well, thank you, Tim Waters. It's a beautiful spring day in Longmont, Colorado. Yeah. Wouldn't rather be anywhere else. Um, Don Wood, born in Boulder, Colorado in 1955, moved all the way from Boulder, Colorado to Broomfield, and at the rich age of three, moved from Broomfield to Longmont, and been in Longmont ever since, other than a few years in San Jose, California, after graduating from the University of Colorado. Married to Karen Kanemoto, best thing I ever did in my life, when I should have remained that for the rest of my life, and Karen and I have two wonderful kids, Julie and Eric, who graduated from Skyline High School here in Longmont. And we have three grandkids, and ages six, four, and three. Two of them, two boys in California, and one lovely little girl right here in Longmont. Um, what questions do you have for us, Tim? Uh, just talk, talk a little bit about, your, your among your contributions to the community have been, uh, uh, over generations, kind of the, the go-to uh, organization or, or service for travel. And I know that you're in a, in a transitional period, but I think people would enjoy knowing that connection as well. Our, our, uh, probably our, our largest tie to Longmont is my wife Karen and I and our son Eric have been running Gold Key Travel for Longmont. Uh, Karen and I have been in it for 40 years, Eric for 11 years. My mother, Mitzi Wood, started Gold Key Travel in 1966 in the lobby of Longmont National Bank. And we moved from the bank in 1984 to a nice little house at 328 Kaufman Street, which we've enjoyed for the last uh, 35 years. And quite a transition. It's, you know, this, this time of, of uh, downturn in our economy and um, our timing is unusual. In February of this year, our son Eric came to us and said, 11 years has been long enough. I'm ready to start a new <laughs> path. And so get ready for me to leave. I'm out of state. Just pick it up. And uh, as Eric had taken over the management of the company, we said, well, we're not just going to survive this year unless we've been looking at retirement anyway. So, well, we'll put out feelers to see if we'll sell Gold Key Travel. Perfect timing. This has been the best year Gold Key Travel has ever had. Everything was lined up. The stars were aligned. And this darn COVID-19 came to town. <coughs> and that, uh, travel was hit as hard as probably any other industry. Uh, I know many industries have been hit. And, and worldwide, everybody is feeling the effects of this. You just, I just can't imagine somebody not feeling the effects of this virus. But travel especially hit hard when you 
think that um, air travels down 97 percent. That that's a pretty big number. Yeah. And so that um, that set gold key back for the year. In the travel business, you you do your business about two years ahead. You sell everything, and then finally the people travel, and that's when we get paid. Well, for the last two years worth of work, we're not going to get paid. Um, because our employees have been with us, we have a family at Gold Key, a team that's been with us 30 plus years, and uh, it really is a family. 15 uh, people working for Gold Key Travel, and um, 10 of those people also were close to retirement, and when they heard that we were going to be leaving, they were deciding they leave as well. So it's quite a, quite a change for Longmont because it's, um, it's certainly the largest agency. At one time there were 10 agencies in, in Longmont and now there's, there's Gold Key Travel and then a couple other smaller um, agencies. But anyway, oh, no. we've decided to keep our staff on and we're gonna get through the summer here and then see what happens. I know many people in Longmont appreciate uh, what Gold Key has, has represented to, to them and to their families. So I have three questions. You know, the first one is, in this time of, <clears> that's <throat> extraordinary that none of us have ever experienced, and all of the unknowns that go along with this, uh, and a lot of fear that goes along with uh, what's happened to the world, how are you getting through this period of time? Our family has, has had the luxury of being raised by Tom and Mitzi Wood. And Tom and Mitzi Wood pretty much beat into us, you save for a rainy day. And we can't thank them enough. And I'm sure their parents did the same thing for them, um, coming through the depression and knowing that things can happen. You just don't know. And so you, you prepare for that and you live within your means and it's not raining, it is pouring out there. And it's a, it's a good time to have been saving for. Um, so we're not gonna be as affected as, as other people are. And I, and I really do empathize for everyone out there because everybody has a different story and these are really difficult times. It, this is my new favorite word, unprecedented. Yeah. We, hear it, we hear it every day. Our world. I know we'll get through it. I'm an optimist and I know we'll get through it, but there will be people that feel the pain and um, some, some will not survive and that's very sad and, and lives will be changed forever by this but we will come out of it. And historians will talk about this 2020, the year of 2020 for a long time. I, I hope it's only 2020. I, I, I don't want them to be talking about 2021, 2022, but right now we're an un, it's an unknown. And that's part of the problem, the unknown. People do not like the unknown, and, but that's where we are right now. And so if, if any kids are out there, save, save, save. One of the things that, that we do know right now is that uh, we're living in a time of, um, of physical separation and social distancing that we've never experienced, along with the other things that we're experiencing. Uh, so in this time when you can't be together uh, with your family and your friends, how are you staying connected with your family and your friends? Uh, only because this is not gonna be viewed by anybody for another 30 years, is that right, Tim? No, no, people are going to view this next week or the week after. Yeah. <laughs> Darn. Well, I'll admit, we've been cheating a little bit. <laughs> and um, we have a large family, and the family works in the business, and the, the office lends itself to the ability where we can go into the office and, and stay um, socially distant from each other. And, and so we have been able to go into the office, and so there is some interaction that maybe other people aren't afforded. Um, so as much as we would love to, you know, shake hands and hug and whatnot, we're not able to every day distance. We're not able to do that. But we are getting some interaction, which I think has been very fortunate for us and makes us probably just feel better every day. Because that, that is a big loss. That we can't see our friends like we would like to see them. We see them on Zoom and that's we need the physical interaction and face-to-face -to, -face, um, to make life really worthwhile. So we look forward to getting back to that. Well, Don, um, the third question for you and for others in, in this project uh, is, is based on the presumption that whatever was normal, 
whatever life was, our normal routines, life's going to be different on the other side of this. We just don't know how. So the question is, um, assuming life is going to be different, what's your preferred future? What would you like to see and help create on the other side of the pandemic? I think as far as things that are going to be different, and here's the, the positive sign, I think people have been placed in their homes with their families with more time than they've ever had before. And I hope they're cherishing that time. And maybe we come out of this with families being stronger uh, because they now see that there's so much worthwhile interaction within the family. So I'm, I'm really hoping the families are, are a stronger unit our lives are so busy and we have so many, so much stimulation out there with, you know, the screen time and, and everything else that's out there. Uh, I'm hoping that families are back to playing games and with each other and, and really connecting. And so that, that would be the, the, the positive side. I think the, it's going to be a, a, a negative side and difficult for us is how we're going to pay for this. How, is our government going to stay? Well, there's never so long I've not been on budget, but we really need to make sure our dollars are spent wisely by our government and by ourselves. And so I'm hoping that we can figure that out. I know people will now know, like I said earlier, the importance of savings. I hope our government can learn that as well. Though it's going to be, I don't know how, it's going to be a very expensive time coming through these next few years. Uh, lots to anticipate and lots to learn from this experience. Don Wood, thank you again for your contribution to this project and uh, decades of contribution to the community from the Wood family. Tim Waters, thank you and thank you for your contribution to what you <laughs> well, do our wonderful city. I'm just a bit player in it all. I, uh, <laughs> listen, stay safe, take care of yourself and, and, and all your family members, both professional and, and, and personal. You do the same. Thank you, Tim. Right. Nadine Lester, thank you so much for your willingness to contribute to this project by lending your voice and vision to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. So to begin this interview, it would be helpful for all of us to learn a little bit about who you are. So tell us about Nadine Lester. Okay, I am Nadine Lester. I live in Southmore Park lived in Longmont for about 40 years. Uh, I'm a retired teacher. I taught in Longmont Public Schools for about 12 years. And then I taught in uh, adult education for the school district and um, at Front Range for about 14 years. Um, but now I'm at home. Um, love the Longmont community, raised our children here. My husband works for IBM. He's not retired. He, um, we raised our children here. Both of them graduated from Niwot High School. I feel very connected to this community. And I've appreciated living here, you know, all this time. Well, that's me, and I and I I really enjoy the way Longmont is organized and the way our um, government works here. And I I'm happy to make a contribution. Well, you are making one today, and and we appreciate it. So you know, I'm going to ask you three questions. And the first question is that uh, in this period of time, I, I, if we go back and look historically, there have been times where humanity has been distanced and isolated from one another, but not in our lifetimes, not like this. So in a time where we're physically separated and socially distanced, how are you getting through this period of time with all of the unknowns and uncertainties and concerns associated with it? Well, that is an interesting question. And I... I enjoyed kind of reflecting on that. I had to ask myself, um, how am I getting through this? And, you know, in all honesty, I really had to pray about it. Um, I don't like idleness. I don't like feeling a lack of purpose. I don't like feeling disconnected. So, you know, and this quarantine is all about serving others um, precisely by being isolated. And, you know, that was challenging for me. So I started by tapping into all the productive things or things that I consider productive that I do on my own. So things like my hobbies and clubs and associations. 
anything where I could see some results for my efforts, no matter how small. And then what I did was I came up with a daily to-do list that I share with my sister who lives in Omaha. This was really the answer prayer for me. We go on record with each other about all the things we're going to accomplish during the day. And then we tell each other what we actually did accomplish. Um, and I really like paying attention to the things I do where I can see results for my efforts. Um, and we always start our list with something that we've already done because it's so encouraging. <laughs> you know, so the first item might be write a to-do list, check, you know. Um, so today's list says things like coffee, prayer, study Italian, get some exercise, dress for success, Zoom interview, that's on there. Um, and some days are busier than others, but I say that my list and sharing with my sister Christine, that's the number one thing that's getting me through this. Uh, Nadine, I, I've tried to make very few editorial comments as we go through these interviews because it's really about the interview we, but I, I will, based on what you just said, was, is it Stephen Covey and his seven uh, habits of successful people uh, that, that one of them is starting with the end in mind? Uh, and, and it sounds like that's exactly how you're approaching this uh, this period. So well, look at that. So he was thank, inspired too, no doubt. Yeah, yes. Uh, so uh, in addition to uh, figuring out how to get through through this as an individual, yeah. uh, in a time when we can't be together physically, we're all trying to figure out how to stay connected with family and friends. So yeah. how does that work for you? How how are you staying connected with family and friends? Okay, well, I'm just going to say thank you. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter, but I have been using technology, and uh, YouTube has been great. I subscribe to the City of Longmont YouTube channel, which I don't know if I would have gotten around to that without, you know, I usually watch on TV or show up at council meetings myself. So that's been great. I, I actually feel better connected with some of the things going on in the in the city, you too. Um, and then, you know, I've been doing phone calls and emails and texts, FaceTime and Zoom. But you know what? One good way I've stayed connected, I think, has been the postal service. Because I had time to think about Easter, I sent gifts to family members and I made cards and sent, sent them to people and they have really enjoyed that. Um, you know, my cousin's little kids were so thrilled to get Easter gifts. And I don't know that I would have been able to connect with them in that way, unless it was under these circumstances. It's, it's really been a silver lining, good old postage. Um, and stuff like that, that Thunderbird flyover on Saturday, mm -hmm. uh, that was just great. All the neighbors came out in their yards and we didn't, we didn't see it here, it was too cloudy, but we had a great time looking for it. Um, <laughs> And then we've been doing random stuff like that in our front yards and watching the kids on their bikes or doing cartwheels and stuff has just, it's just been a joy. And I have wonderful neighbors and this has just made that connection even stronger. Uh, well, there's some themes that, that we're hearing in these interviews that are real consistent with your experience. So, um, and a lot of us stood out looking for those, for those jets on Saturday and <laughs> see them. Did you know, my, we didn't see him. We went out and looked for him as well uh, and uh, finally gave up and we heard him go overhead about the time we came inside. So. We could hear him. There was that. You know, uh, my third question for you is, uh, this would, uh, based on a presumption that whatever normal was on the front side of this pandemic, there's going to be a new normal on the other side of it. Life won't be just like it was before the pandemic. That's the presumption. So given that, my question for you is, what's your preferred future? What would you like to see? And what are you willing to help create or would like to create as the new normal? I feel so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I thought about this and I asked my daughters and my neighbors too, and and something came to mind for me. Remember a year ago, it was on April 15th, 2019, that Notre Dame in Paris was in flames. 
And it was a terrible disaster. And it was absolutely appalling and heartbreaking that this was even happening. And, but the, the fire got put out and people pulled together, people have raised money and that church is being rebuilt, restored and improved. Um, I was thinking uh, in some ways it's going to be unchanged from the building the world has known and loved for centuries. And in some ways it's going to be better because of advances in construction capabilities um, and those improvements probably would have taken a lot longer without the disaster. And I think this pan virus is a disaster, which is an action of undoing by the stars. You know, <laughs> it's not something we asked for. It's not some, it's something that happened to us. Um, I'm really seeing the coronavirus epidemic in that same way. It's a disaster. We've been, forced to stop our usual routines. We've had some demands put on us that some would say are burning down our economy, our normal way of life, our expectations about the pursuit of happiness as our modern culture has defined it. What will be the result of this fire? I say some good things, and I firmly believe that. Most of the time, people can't see the goodness in individual actions though it's something we all long for. I'm so hopeful that the world will remember that personal actions add up and that they are in fact more important than anything else. Will we go back to criticizing and complaining? Will we prefer to see the bad in things that we don't have any control over? Or will we see that something is going on that isn't politics or economics and there have been some results that are <laughs> The virus hasn't spread as fast as it could have. Dolphins came back to the canals of Venice. For the first time in 18 years, the month of March saw no school shootings in the United States. A bald eagle flew over my neighborhood yesterday morning and it was quiet enough to hear mallards in the creek behind my house because there was no traffic. It will be harder to argue that humans can't hold off on some of their frantic activity because we're doing it. <laughs> it will be harder to say that our individual actions don't add up to something. So in the future, I am so hopeful that we will have a better conversation about the power of collective action. And I'm hoping this event will help us lift up our hearts. That's my speech. Nadine. Lester, that's a great speech. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to think about this beforehand. And thank you uh, for your contributions to this project. My pleasure. Stay, take care of yourself, stay safe. And uh, our paths will cross when we are able to be out and about again. And uh, yes, indeed. Remembering, oh, the, remembering the lessons that you've just suggested we, we need to take with us. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Seth Miller, thank you so much for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Uh, as you know, we're starting these interviews by learning something about the people being interviewed. So tell us about Seth Miller. Uh, so I am, um, I work from home and I've worked from home for the last decade, decade plus um, as an independent consultant in, in uh, science and technology sort of innovation management. So I help companies figure out how they're going to build their next products um, and how they're going to invest their money for their future. Um, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I have a background as a PhD scientist, um, but I haven't done lab work in, in over a decade now. Well, that's, that's great preparation, obviously, for what you're doing and way over prepared for this interview, I think. <laughs> so uh, I have three questions for you, sure. as you know. Uh, the first of those questions is, in this time of, uh, probably not, I was reminded by someone in one of these interviews, uh, we're not in an, in an unprecedented moment in all of human history, certainly unprecedented time in our lifetimes. So given that um, and the distancing associated with it, how, how are you getting yourself through this unprecedented period? You know, for me personally, it's been interesting because for, for me, a lot of this is welcome to my world. I've been working out of my house since 2008. 
you know, I got let go by a company um, in November of 2008. And, um, and it was not the best time to be unemployed. Um, 2008. And, and yeah, I, I had I had a few months of savings, right? But I didn't have enough. Um, I had by the time I was really quite lucky um, and able to get my first gig um, in the middle of 2009, where I actually my income started to exceed my expenses by by June of 2009, um, which is incredibly fast, especially for that era. But um, you know, I I had um, less than a month of savings in the bank at that point. Um, this this is hard. Um, so you know, for me, strangely, this has been less because I went through that uh, 12 years ago. This has been less traumatic for me. I'm used to this idea that I'm working from home. My pace of work hasn't changed. My daughter, who was in college, um, has had to come home, and that's been a change. And as her dad, um, I, I will selfishly say that it's been wonderful to have her back. Um, she would rather not be here, but it has been. Um, spectacular to have her presence. Um, and, you know, I, I honestly, I'm trying to focus on welcoming the opportunities that this creates. There's, there's, there's a lot of disruption um, in everything. And I've absolutely lost clients. And, and there are people who are not going to be able to pay me that for work that I've done because their, their companies are in tatters right now, or that at least maybe it won't be, it won't be for months now. And that's, and that's hard for everybody. And I respect that. Um, but, you know, I'm just trying to, to focus on recognizing that all of this is going to wash over us um, and there are some good things that are going to happen and I get an extra few months with my daughter is is at the top of my list. Uh, some of those good things that could happen are, are part of my third question but the second question is you're a, you're a pro at staying connected or working with people virtually uh, so how are you staying connected with friends and family during um, this time of isolation? Yeah so I did on Thursday. So today is a Saturday that we're doing this interview. And on Thursday, I did a, uh, a happy hour with some friends from college, which was really neat because I haven't, you know, we don't accept on Facebook, you know, we'll comment on each other's posts, but I haven't seen many of these people in decades, um, or at least since, you know, since a college reunion five, however many years ago. Um, so it's really kind of wonderful to be able to just stand there. And I will, I chopped vegetables and prepared dinner for family while everybody else was talking. And it, it, it's kind of cool. And I'm going to do the same thing next weekend with another set of friends who I haven't gotten together like that with. And, you know, we have such a big country. We have all of these friends. All of us have friends who have moved away or we've moved away from them. And so this is really kind of neat being forced to think about how to connect with them, having the technology and having everybody have familiarity with it. I don't think these habits are going to change. I think I'm going to keep doing this because I really, really like it. So that's a nice segue to my third question. And the presumption that underlies the question is that whatever was normal for all of us before we got into this period of, of social distancing uh, and, and, the, and the drama and the, some of the trauma that goes along with the economic and financial implications. Assuming on the backside of this, life, whatever the new normal is going to become, is going to be different than it was before. So the third question is, what do you want to see in the new normal? What, what's your preferred future? And I'll attach to that a preferred future that you'd like to help create. So I don't know yet. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm trying to save some time to think about. Because when you're forced to change like this, you know, all of us, all, I'm going to give you a very uh, uh, simple answer. All of us, are, except for you, Tim, are forced <laughs> to consider whether or not we have the right hair right now. Um, you know, we, we, you're, you're being forced to grow your hair long and you ask yourself whether or not that is, um, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you are actually forced to answer these questions that you hadn't, you can just ignore. You can just go every month to the same person to get the same haircut and it doesn't matter whether or not it's optimal. And, and we can we have this opportunity to take that to, to a lot of different aspects of our lives, right? Are we spending enough time and are we, you know, now that we're forced to hang out in different ways with our family, um, are we doing it right? I mean, is there a way we should be doing it better, right? Should I really be spending so much time looking at Twitter? Probably not, right? Not while, my, not while I have children that I really should be paying attention to, having just graduated and then adopted back my, my eldest. Um, I recognize that I, I only pro, pro hopefully I'm going to do this once and damn it, I should be paying attention to her at dinner. 
So, um, so that's one part of it. All of our human relationships, we have a chance to sort of sit back and we're being forced to reevaluate them and um, remind ourselves what is giving us the most pleasure. And then, so this is a great opportunity. In, in terms of the world, you know, I think that we can say some of that push forward, you know, out into the world. You know, how are we um, investing our time? How are we investing our money um, in order to be able to, to maximize what we most get out of this? So, you know, I, I, on, a, on a personal like mission, like I'm very much interested in renewable energy and, in, and I, I see that there's a global climate crisis, which feels a little bit like the coronavirus just spread out in time. There's a the disaster. It's happening on the course of years rather than the course of weeks. Um, but we can learn, we can take what we're learning from this and uh, ask ourselves what habits did were just habits and you know which things were important. Some of these things that we think that we need to change are going to be very difficult to change for global warming, just like we're trying for coronavirus. Some of the things we're going to find out are like a new haircut. It's like, oh, I didn't realize I could just fall into this new thing. I want to be able to find those opportunities. This is a great excuse to search and hopefully we'll be able to, all of us, enough of us will have the mental space right now to be able to find a few of those things. We don't have to find all of them, but if we can all just find a few things about our lives and our world that we can make better and more sustainable, then that will be something positive we can take out of this. Well, that sounds like a, a pretty aspirational view of where we are and where we're headed. And I, I very much appreciate your sharing those aspirations, your voice and your vision with this project. Uh, take care of yourself, stay safe, and take care of your family. Tim, thank you for inviting me. Sherry Malloy, thank you so much for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Tell us a, a little bit about who you are. So whoever watches these these interviews will know who they're hearing from. Okay, well, um, as you said, my name is Sherry Malloy. I'm originally from Chicago. I've lived in Colorado since 1984, in, in Longmont since 1986, so a good long while now. Uh, I'm a retired special education teacher, public education, taught here in St. Vrain, um, and Colorado Springs before that, and Chicago before that, so a total of 35 years. I retired about five years ago. And uh, I have two grown children, uh, Brian, who is 30, and his sister, Colleen, who just turned 29. Uh, they live in, Brian's in Lafayette, Colleen's in Durango, and um, I have a wonderful husband, J.D. Gleitz, who I married um, two years ago after a very long time being um, single, after being divorced when my kids were very young. and. Um, yeah, just um, happy to have this opportunity um, in this um, most unusual time. Yeah, so building on that, <laughs> this most unusual time, I was reminded in one of these interviews that, that there probably were periods in, in human history when there was this kind of isolation, but not in any, of our, in any of our lifetimes. So in a time that we've never experienced of physical separation and social isolation, uh, with all of the drama and the fear and that goes along with that, how are you getting yourself through this period? You know, um, pretty well, very well, I would say. Um, I, um, I uh, have, it's just the mixed bag, it's the mixed bag of what life is on steroids, super, you know, intensified in terms of, um, fear and uncertainty and you know health concerns and economic concerns and future concerns you know just all of that and at the same time i'm really <laughs> sort of enjoying the slower pace and the time to reflect and the time to um just be and so i'm personally doing you know pretty well i i did write down my three questions and want to just make sure i um but yeah, it's 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 just you know that mixed bag that life is. You know, it's really sweet and um and terribly scary. And uh, we are uh, you know are incredibly fortunate. We have a home. We have electricity. We have power. You know, um, uh, heat. We have f food. We're 
were very well provided for. And so to, to know that and to, um, to be aware of, you know, people in refugee camps in Syria and, you know, in our own community who are really struggling, you know, with the loss of jobs, with health, separation from families, loneliness, um, uh, you know, addiction, um, homelessness, uh, you know, domestic violence. I mean, there's a lot of suffering. And so holding both of those things has been personally challenging to, you know, sort of know that. And yet my life is great. I'm looking outside. We've got chickadees making a little nest. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all really surreal. Um, but um, we are, uh, in terms of self-care, you know, taking the guidelines very seriously, very much aware that our, what we do impacts others and what they're doing impacts us. And so sort of, you know, really um, taking that very, very seriously. And, um, and then, uh, you know, really enjoying the time um, with JD, he's a United pilot, and so there hasn't an international pilot, so there has not been any flying. He took a voluntary leave for the month of uh, April with reduced pay, and uh, he does have a couple trips scheduled in May, but that's not looking like that's even going to happen. And so, um, so we're really enjoying the time together. Um, we are Buddhist, so we are doing. Uh, we have a daily practice of meditation, so we're doing that, and we're doing reading, and we're reflecting, and we're studying some Dharma. That's the, the Buddhist teachings, and um, you know, really enjoying that. We started a gratitude journal, um, and yeah, you know, so you know, on that front, it's kind of, kind of really sweet. I I did hear this report on um, NPR recently about what to do in times of trauma, you know, in terms of self-care. And, and uh, it was four M's. So the first one was mon mindfulness meditation or prayer, you know, some sort of stillness. Mm -hmm. uh, second one was um, movement. So especially outside. So we have an old dog who still likes long walks. So, you know, getting movement every day. The third one was mastery, finding projects and little things. I'm working on this big wall hanging, you know, like to get going on some closets and things like that but I haven't really found that motivation yet but you know kind of doing something that you feel a sense of accomplishment not huge you know could be baking bread um and then the last one was um what's the last one mindful mindfulness movement mastery and and um oh meaningful connection so this you know staying in touch with people which i know in the next question as well as to the greater community you know giving money where we can i've done some volunteering at hope with their sh um, showering and some errands and you know kind of um i don't sew so i can't do masks but you know uh, um, participating in the daily um uh howling i'm loving that you know have my alarm set for eight seven fifty seven and get out and howl and so that, you know, just kind of, to, um, yeah, so those are the things. And then I added a fifth one, an M, because we're also um, listening to, you know, James Taylor and Carly Simon and music. Sorry, that last one was music. So um, so that's kind of the things, you know, in terms of resource cooking, helping our local restaurants with um, getting takeout, you know, trying to at least once a week. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, just really mostly enjoying the time to read and reflect and reset. Um, and then every night we watch Netflix and we're really into Anne with an E, the story of Anne Green Gables. And so we have tea every night and watch an episode of that. And the big question is, do we do popcorn tonight or not? Um, and of course, doing the Zoom, you know, and, and all of those kinds of things. So, um, so you know, so far our health is good and we're doing okay. Kids are good, yeah, day at a time. Well, your reference to Zoom kind of sets up the second question as a nice segue. And that is in this time where we can't be together, uh, how do you stay connected? So how are you staying connected to family and friends? Yeah, so um, JD's mother is an um, independent living situation at Balfour in Louisville. And uh, so they are um, for a while, for a couple months, haven't um, allowed people in or out. 
Um, but they are, um, so we're calling her every day. You know, she's safe there in the skilled nursing. They've had a couple of cases, but it's a separate facility. Um, and so we call her every day and she's been trying to Zoom, but it hasn't worked. So I signed up to be a host now. So we're going to do a practice Zoom where we can walk her through it tomorrow. So, um, but she's very sharp, very, um, very sharp, much sharper than me. And, um, you know, she's doing well. So we call her, talk to the kids, you know, more regularly. I mean, that's one of the nice things that you're actually, or I'm actually having some more contact with people that I'd, you know, not been in much contact with. Um, of course, texting, my kids more texting than emails, maybe, or I mean, um, phone calls. But, um, and then we do the Zoom for some exercise. I do my yoga now um, mm -hmm. with the Zoom and Nia, which is another exercise program I love. And um, we have we're in two medication, meditation groups. So we're doing that on Zoom. We're listening to some, some Dharma talks by some teachers on Zoom, um, some community meetings kind of thing that are happening on Zoom. Like Tuesday, there's a meeting for, um, I think it's Tuesday, the 21st for, uh, with Mike Doherty around people who are homeless. So, you know, really kind of taking advantage, full advantage of that and then staying connected with friends. Um, so that's, yeah, just, um, you know, using all the technology and at the same time sort of limiting, trying to limit that a little bit. Oh, and that was another thing for self-care, kind of limiting news, morning maybe PBS news hour at night. We had some Dharma talks going on there, but that's going to three times a week next week. So then we can get back into the channel six PBS um, news hour. And that's it. Limiting news is I think kind of especially helpful for mental, emotional and spiritual health. So that's that question. Well, given uh, these conditions, right. And, and the stay at home order and, you know, all that we're dealing with with this pandemic, the the last question the, the underlying assumption is or presumption is that whatever life is like on the backside when we come out from underneath the stay-at-home order and the pandemic's under control whatever life is like it's going to be different life won't return to what it was before so the last question is what would you like that life to be what's your preferred future and what's the future you'd like to help create you know, and that's, of course, the most important question and the one I've been reflecting on a lot um, because um, you're right. You know, it's going to be life before COVID and after COVID. Yeah. I mean, it's a defining moment individually, collectively, and um, or a defining time. And I think it's continuing to evolve, um, but it's... Uh, It's, it's a huge opportunity. I mean, I've, I've, I've really become so much more aware of how interdependent we are. You know, everything. The, the lights are on. Somebody's doing that. You know, the food I eat, my dog food, you know, furniture. I haven't built any of it. You know, all of it has been done or set in place by others and then is even brought to us by truckers and, you know, people out in the fields harvesting, which, of course, we all know that, but you know, just the, the the giantness of how interdependent and interconnected we are, and how our planet is just one giant terrarium, if you will. And so, um, you know, they had a they had an astronaut, a woman astronaut, on the other day on the radio, and she was saying, "I look at the Earth," and she's been in, up in space for seven months, and she was actually coming home Saturday, and. Uh, you know, she said, I look and the earth looks exactly the same. It's still this beautiful, stunning, you know, planet. And um, yet she knows that everything has changed. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, how, what we do with this is, is the challenge, you know, um, and I have had cha personal challenges as we all have in our life, losses and, and our own traumas. And, um, early on, and I think it's true now too, I sort of realized, you know, there's, we really come down to a choice. Are we going to be, which path are we going to take? Are we going to become bitter? Are we going to harden our hearts to, you know, fear and, you know, and, and us and them or 
scarcity or, you know, I mean, it's, it's a path to, and bitter is just about self-protection or are we going to soften and become better? And so it's my sincere hope, of course, that we, that we become better and softer and more tolerant and kind and recognizing that interdependence that we all do better when we all do better. And, um, you know, and just kind of seeing things in a whole new light. Um, because to not do so is to our own peril, you know, in terms of, yeah, so. So that's, I don't know, you know, what that will look like. Um, but I very much want to uh, support, you know, an effort to, um, to make us better, not bitter. I mean, we can see both kind of starting to play out already, you know, kind of people feeling tired of this and, you know, questioning um, and, and demonstrating and, you know, and just, and really pushing back and, and it, you could see that it's all coming from a fearful place. So um, I don't know if you know, if you heard this beautiful poem by Katie O'Mara but it really tells, says, speaks for me um, of, you know, your final question. So I just I don't know like, that I've heard it, but I think we should all hear it. Okay. So it's by Kitty O'Meara, who I believe is Canadian. And she wrote a poem called, And the People Stayed Home. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still, and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently, and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed, and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. So that's my hope. Sharon Malloy, first of all, thanks for all your contributions to the community. And especially thanks for your contribution to this project. And well, thank your, you. Letting thank your you voice and vision time. to this project. Yeah. Okay. Be Stay well. Safe. Take care of yourself, JD, and all your extended family members. You do the same. Thank you, Tim. <laughs>